you'll see how um, UNUSA and space agencies are contributing to build resilience and the value of space, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. A couple of words about UNUSA. Um, the off it is the office, the only office um, that is entirely dedicated to space affairs within the United Nations. And it works, it promotes international cooperation in the peaceful uses of outer space and uh, for social, economic and scientific development, in particular for the developing countries. All right, uh, so before starting, um, before presenting the speakers, please let me remind you not to switch on your camera or uh, microphone, so keep them off. Um, so I would like to introduce the speakers. Um, thank you very much for uh, participating, accepting our invitation to this event. We will have, we have representatives from ESA, NASA, JAXA and UN SPIDER, um, the latest being, uh, the latter being uh, UNUSA, a UNUSA program. And uh, we, they will share the insights and experiences on how space technologies um, are supporting um, efforts to build uh, resilience. And then we will have the remarks by the Austrian deputy representative of the Austrian permanent um, mission to the UN in New York. Um, now, I'll, I'll give the floor soon to our first uh, representative, to our first speaker. Um, I, will, um, I would kindly ask uh, um, all the speakers to briefly introduce themselves before going ahead with the presentation. So, um, I would like to give the floor to uh, Kevin Murphy from NASA. Uh, Kevin, thanks again for being here with us today and uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for having us this morning and this afternoon and this evening. Um, <clears throat> uh, we're really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Kevin Murphy. I'm from NASA headquarters. I'm the program executive for the Earth Science Data Systems, um, which are responsible for collecting, processing and disseminating um, all the data NASA collects um, publicly um, uh, for Earth science. Um, and with that, I'll start the presentation. Let me see if I can share my slides here really quickly. Oh, you've got the slides, good. Um, so uh, again, um, I think that, you know, we're kicking off this, this uh, uh, meeting this morning um, and, uh, you know, I think this first slide that, that we jointly cooperated on to develop um, uh, since kind of the early kind of April, May time period really is emblematic of the work that we've done together to harness um, these various satellite assets to look at environmental change uh, as, as it has occurred um, through our kind of response to um, this global pandemic. Um, next slide, please. Um, the objectives of this cooperation were to demonstrate the joint capabilities of JAXA, ESA, and NASA to observe environmental and economic impacts of COVID-19 from space using data from over 17 Earth observing missions, to develop Earth observation data-driven dashboards to clearly communicate indicators to the general public and decision makers, to leverage the strong and continuing cooperation and collaboration among ESA, NASA, and JAXA to address this global issue, uh, really by leveraging our complementary assets um, in space um, and engage the wider public via the Space Apps Challenge that we completed in early June and other initiatives and activities that have gone on since then. Next slide, please. Our collaboration really started um, in, in, in April or early May um, and resulted in um, this press release um, and release of our trilateral dashboard um, on the 25th of June, 2020. Um, during that press release, um, we had um, comments by Dr. Thomas Birkin, Dr. Joseph Oshbacher, and Dr. Koji Tarada um, of NASA, ESA, and JAXA. And they really emphasized that we have a unique and vital view, um, a synoptic view of the Earth from space. Um, <clears throat> this pandemic is global. 
um, the assets that we have look globally um, and provides that global view on how humans interact with the environment and how we can monitor that from space. Um, not only that, but we must share this information um, with the public, um, so the basic data, but we also must share the knowledge that we gain from that information. Next slide, please. Um, here's one of many examples that we have. And in this example, what we see on the left-hand side are inner two retrievals from the Tropomi um, instrument on, uh, on Sentinel-5P, um, uh, a Copernicus um, uh, contributed instrument and data set. And we see um, in the top left corner, um, a March to April um, average of NO2 over Europe. And on the bottom left panel, we see a significant reduction in some instances over 50% of NO2 um, during kind of the height of the pandemic um, in Europe. And on the right hand side, we see um, NO2 retrievals from the OMI instrument on Aura, um, which is a US instrument over the eastern United States. And you can see similarly a reduction in the use of fossil fuels um, during the pandemic period um, in March of 2020, um, reduced NO2 levels significantly um, in that area. Next slide, please. But not only can we look at those uh, indicators that are in the atmosphere, but we can also see kind of um, uh, indicators related to human activity um, or uniquely human activity. And those are the lights at night um, that we can sense in this instance from the SUMI NPP VIRS instrument, um, <clears throat> which is a collaboration between NASA and NOAA. Um, and what we see here on the left hand side is a localized light change after a shelter in place order from March 22nd of 2020. Um, and if you zoom in on there on the right hand side, you can see the University of California um, San Francisco Medical Center is kind of that um, uh, round area there, the parking structures that surround it and the park that's behind it to the south. Um, and, and you can see that they built tents um, to the right of that um, as well. Okay, I think I lost the slides. Let's see here. Let me put up. Hopefully you have the slides back now. Um, I'm trying to present, but can you hear me? You, yes, we can hear you. If you want, we can uh, upload um, the slides for you. OK, I had the slides up. Can you see them now? No, not yet. OK, mine shows yeah. it. Yes, okay. that's perfect. Thanks. Not be sure what happened there. <laughs> um, and in this, and you can see on the right hand side, um, the development of a, uh, uh, a temporary parking structure, a tent um, that's been lit, lit up. Uh, to, to help and bring in additional patients on the. Um, and here's an example of, of a collaboration between uh, uh, JAXA and ESA instruments, um, ALOS 2 and Sentinel-1. Um, and in this instance, what we are monitoring on the left um, are kind of the density of cars in a parking lot. Um, <clears throat> and you can see the reduction from December of 2019 um, uh, through March of 2020. Um, as as you know, the area in Beijing was was kind of slowed down um, as a result of of the lockdown um, that they encountered. Um, and finally, um, on Sentinel two on the right, or Sentinel one from Copernicus and ESA on the right, um, you can see um, uh, uh, a signal, which is kind of hard to see here, but um, you can see that there was car movement out of a parking area um, to accommodate um, a large tent for COVID-19 patients on, on April 22nd. Um, and at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Yves-Louis um, to continue the presentation. And uh, Yves-Louis, I will uh, just continue um, to present um, and you just tell me to go forward, okay? 
Okay, perfect, Kevin. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me well? Yes, that's perfect. If, we, if you could uh, please introduce yourself. Okay, I'm um, Ivry Desnos from the European Space Agency. We are based in Rome, or near Rome in Frascati. I'm leading the data application division, and uh, we are concerned with several topics uh, which are close to uh, UN interest, in particular science, education, uh, application, uh, industry growth, and we have also a platform engineering team. So with this group, we have been uh, supporting the activity uh, with this trilateral uh, dashboard, which was developed in uh, actually in a very short time, time frame of less than two months, as uh, Kevin has informed you. So shall we get to the next slide, Kevin, please? Okay, the, this slide is about the water quality. Uh, we use as a water quality proxy the chlorophyll concentration. And here we are lucky because we have the complementary of observation from the three agency. So we have data from uh, namely Sentinel-3, GCOM-C and Aqua. And of course, uh, during the lo lockdown, we can, which is, uh, you can see in shaded gray, in particular in Italy, because we are observing the Adriatic Sea, uh, we observe uh, really a decrease of signal over a large part of the Adriatic, Adriatic Basin, uh, which were, is not usually observed at this time of the year. You have also the Venice Lagoon, and this was the more one of the uh, things we, we showed at the beginning where, of course, reduction in human activity means reduction of uh, uh, marine traffic, absence of tourists, and a potentially uh, uh, anthropogenic effect. So uh, this is still uh, under investigation by the science team, and of course, uh, uh, they told us that they have already started to jointly publish on, on this work. Uh, next slide. Kevin? Yes. This slide is about uh, agriculture productivity. Uh, we are curious to see how we can monitor, of course, uh, agriculture from space, and we have application for that. Uh, in the context of the COVID, actually, uh, organization like the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization or World Food Program, uh, experts uh, express uh, their concern that COVID-19 outbreak might turn from a health crisis to a global food crisis. So observation we have from satellites such as uh, Sentinel-2, Landsat-8, or even Pulsar can provide really timely information at global scale for monitoring the impact of lockdown. Uh, in Europe, the example we are showing here, uh, the COVID outbreak severely, of course, restricted the movement of seasonal agricultural workers, and it affected the uh, labor-intensive harvesting of uh, asparagus in Germany. And we observe uh, from, uh, from space a decrease of uh, uh, close to 20%. Uh, the observation uh, have been up to, updated up to uh, the 16th of June of this year. And this was confirmed by the German Farmer Association, which is expecting a total harvest of 23% uh, uh, below the average harvesting uh, of, uh, in Germany last year. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, here it's about a bit the technology. I've seen there were questions on the technology uh, uh, we use for this dashboard and uh, enabling us, uh, development in such uh, short time scales. First, it's about uh, collaboration, uh, collaboration among science teams from the three agencies. So we have set a number of uh, science gr group, engineering working group, and they, of course, they share their know-how. And uh, we share also, of course, the uh, satellite data, satellite sensor data. Uh, we use uh, distributed data hosting and processing. Uh, and then we have uh, the scientific teams have uh, proposed a number of algorithms and AI technology to derive some of the results. Uh, we are sharing data, but we are sharing also API. And we are uh, leveraging on a technology which is very modern, which is called the, the Data Cube, which is allow, allowing users to do data analytics. And then we have been capable to publish this uh, dashboard uh, focusing on environmental, economic indicators, uh, and so forth. Uh, this uh, dashboard, uh, we have also opened a number of contests uh, in Europe and in the US where actually uh, citizens can, can themselves develop applications using this kind of technology. Uh, next slide. 
So as Kevin informed, we have released the first version of the dashboard on June 25th. Uh, the total number of, of visits uh, so far is 88,000, which is quite uh, significant. Uh, with the top countries uh, of interest uh, using the dashboard are US, India, Holland, Italy, United Kingdom, and so forth. You have some uh, referrals in uh, some of the uh, most prominent uh, websites in US, Europe, and Japan. Uh, in terms of the filtering of the country I use, you have the US, France, Italy, India, Germany, and so on. Uh, it, you have various uh, areas of interest which have been uh, uh, captured public interest like Paris, the world, Dakar, the North Adriatic Sea, uh, Milano, pollution over Milano. And you have on the right side the top indicators uh, which are being uh, uh, used and watched uh, by the public, uh, starting with air quality, but also uh, monitoring of uh, economic indicators of airports, night lights, greenhouse gases, etc. Uh, next. So, in terms of the future, I think we, we had also a question on that. Uh, we are, of course, continuing this uh, cooperation, uh, which is very successful. I mean, it's the first time in a, such a short time scale where people have been capable to deploy a, such a solution for, for public and decision makers. We are going to uh, load on the dashboard new data. Uh, we, of course, we will expand the uh, data along the, uh, the economic recovery, uh, fortunately, during this uh, year. Uh, we are going to uh, increase the coverage. Uh, we are thinking to go also in the southern hemispheres, uh, provide new indicators. Uh, we, of course, there's a lot of automation which is uh, being built in to deliver uh, updates on a weekly or daily or, or monthly basis. And the science team, of course, have an interest of uh, publishing, uh, outreaching. So we are seeking to, to organize jointly scientific session in major conference and uh, keep the, uh, these teams working together. Next. So the last, this is uh, just a picture of the uh, group picture of all the people involved from the three agency. There is a very high motivation among all those uh, working together and trying to provide a solution for, for the benefit of the public and, and mankind. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Actually, there is something that I wanted to mention. Um, is that the, the session is being recording. Um, so just for your uh, information. Um, I believe now um, I'm, I'm really thankful for uh, your presentation. Uh, it's very interesting to see, like you could see from the statistics, this has clearly been a very successful uh, um, instrument and uh, I'm happy to see that um, it will be extended. Um, I will now give the floor to Aki Kokuze from the um, Japanese uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, uh, moving into something a bit more specific. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Veronica san, and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Aki Kokuze uh, from uh, JAXA, Japanese Space Agencies. I am involved in Greenhouse Gases Observation Satellite Program. Today, I will present space-based greenhouse gases information and the COVID-19 pandemic. So next, please. So satellite observation is the only method that can measure global and long-term CO2 distribution. However, the seasonal change and annual increase are only a few parts per million on a global scale. Therefore, the space agencies have collaborated for over two decades to demonstrate the effectiveness of the CO2 monitoring from space. As you see in the lower part, lower left part, the ESA European uh, Schematic Instrument and also our JAXA's GOSAT instrument are jointly measuring uh, CO2 density from space for uh, almost 20 years. And uh, you can see the annual increase 
of the CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. And if you look at the <coughs> lower left, uh, lower light fields, uh, this is the assimilated NASA OCO2 difference in CO2 in a uh, CO2 concentration in, of this year. As you can see, that uh, emission reductions over Asian regions, uh, especially in early this year, in the blue part of this map. And our GOSAT is very good at uh, mega city observations where we assume that uh, large CO2 anthropogenic uh, emission sources. Next, please. So we'll show how satellites can monitor emissions uh, from the top of the atmosphere. Our GOSAT has been targeting a mega city since 2009 it's of, of its launch. If you look at the upper light figures, when the GOSAT overpass Japan, we can target uh, the greater Tokyo areas. The GOSAT has more than 10,000 spectral channels to measure solar light and also uh, summer emissions from atmosphere. From these 10,000 spectral uh, channels data, we can measure both upper and lower atmospheric uh, CO2 densities. CO2 emissions and enhanced densities we can show the in the lower atmosphere. If you look at the uh, lower light figures, this is the actual GOSAT measured data over greater Tokyo areas. You can see the enhanced CO2 densities, especially at the center of Tokyo. Next one, please. So this sheet shows the average monthly abundance of the CO2 in the lower troposphere for the past four years and this year from GOSAT observations. As you know that CO2 has accumulated in the atmosphere since the <clears throat> industrial revolutions. And we assume that the upper troposphere CO2 density is the up background. So if you calculate the difference in the CO2 densities in the upper and lower uh, atmosphere, we can show the effect of the emissions from the uh, mega cities. Upper part is the Tokyo data, and very upper part is the uh, average of the uh, past four years and January, February, March, and April. And next row shows that the this year. And you can see the <clears throat> smaller difference in uh, uh, February, especially in the March and April. That suggests the lower emissions in the, from the uh, mega city Tokyo. And the lower part is Beijing. You can see in since January and especially in February, you can show the smaller difference that also suggests the effect of the <clears throat> lower emissions uh, are a bit earlier than Tokyo. Next one, please. So next step is we'll consider where the temporary reductions in the CO2 emissions due to COVID-19 restrictions have impacts of lowering the global carbon footprint or not. And so we'll continue and extend the target observation of our GOSAT to more than 50 cities in the world, in addition to Tokyo, Beijing. If you can visit the, our joint uh, dashboard, uh, you can see the results of the seven major cities. And also we'll try to estimate the
the greenhouse gases emissions from individual sectors, such as power plant, transport, and industries. We believe that such kind of research will contribute to the global stocktake of the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Akiko-san, um, for your presentation. Um, I see that somebody has just joined um, and has the video on. Um, I would kindly invite everybody to turn off their cameras and Microsoft, please. Microphones, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I would like to see. OK, well, this is not uh, OK. Well, uh, we move um, forward with our uh, next speaker uh, from UN SPIDER, the UNUSA, one of UNUSA's program. We have Juan Carlos Filagrande Leon. Uh, please, Juan Carlos, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Veronica. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. I am one of the program officers with the UN SPIDER program, and uh, I am based in Bonn, and it gives me a great pleasure to be here with you to present what UN SPIDER is doing. But as you are aware, <clears throat> since uh, several decades ago, governments established disaster management agencies to address the challenges and the impacts of disasters triggered by a variety of hazards, including geological hazards such as tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes and landslides, hydrometeorological hazards such as floods, severe weather or drought. They of course have to deal with other types of hazards such as forest fires. And uh, now we see them active in the context of a locust outbreaks. There's a severe locust outbreak in Eastern Africa that is also impacting India and Pakistan, and of course, since the beginning of the year, they have added COVID-19 to that uh, multi-hazard framework that they are operating on. Since the beginning of the 2005, uh, countries agreed to work together to work on disaster risk reduction as a way to address the resilience of nations. And uh, taking note of the benefits of space-based information, the General Assembly of the United Nations launched the UN SPIDER program through its uh, resolution to facilitate access to uh, space-based information with the hope that developing countries can take advantage of the opportunities made available by the space community in activities conducted in all phases of the disaster management cycle as a way to increase their resilience. Our approach in UN SPIDER is to facilitate access to space-based data, information, and knowledge as a way to enable member states to generate and use space-based information to enhance their resilience. And of course, we raise awareness about the opportunities that are being made available by the space community, such as this dashboard. We operate a, a, the UN SPIDER knowledge portal that offers links to websites that host either space-based imagery, data, products, and software, as well as procedures and information that can be used by countries to deal with disaster risk reduction applications. Uh, UN SPIDER works with a network of regional support offices. And what we have done since 2008 is to conduct missions to assess the use of space technologies in developing countries in Asia, in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and to make recommendations to those disaster management agencies and other government agencies regarding how they can continue to institutionalize the use of that type of space-based information. And together with the UN SPIDER regional support offices around the world and the regional space science and technology education centers affiliated to the United Nations, we carry out capacity building activities and institutional strengthening efforts. Some of the challenges that we have seen uh, when conducting this mission, of course, we see more and more data, more and more software being available 
And we see that member states require supporting identifying which is the relevant new data that they need, what type of software they can use, what type of algorithms they can use to work uh, on measures as a way to achieve the sustainable development goals and those that are stipulated in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and to address some of those aims that have been uh, stipulated in the Paris Climate Agreement. Also, what we have seen from our missions is that countries are requiring support to generate actionable policy relevant information to enhance the resilience to COVID-19 and the other hazards. So this is uh, what we do. We bring together the space community and the disaster management community. We act as a gateway to space-based information. And of course, we try to facilitate capacity building and institutional strengthening efforts. And I would like to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. Um, um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, you could clearly see from uh, the different presentations how uh, this um, is really a global effort and uh, only a, a global effort will, um, is helping us to tackle a global challenge, especially in this case, the COVID-19 pandemic, but not only this one. Um, I would now like to uh, move forward uh, to our uh, last speaker. Uh, we have with us um, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Permanent Mission of Austria to U the United Nations of, in New York. Uh, we have with us is um, Hans Almos Lechner. Um, thank you very much for being today with us. It's a great, it's an honor to have you here. Um, and uh, now I'll give you uh, the floor for uh, your remarks. Thank you very much. Um, it is also a great pleasure and honor for me <clears throat> to participate here today. Um, the side event on space technology for resilience is of particular relevance to Austria. The full impl implementation of the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement and the Addis Abeba Action Agenda is crucial to help better equip the world for future systemic shocks and strengthen resilience. In turn, Enhancing resilience is a prerequisite to ensure long-term achievement of sustainable development. Research conducted by UNOSA has shown that around 40% of the 169 targets between the seven, behind the 17 SDGs benefit from the use of geolocation and Earth observation satellites. The global space sector is evolving rapidly <clears throat> and the UN needs to keep pace in order to reap the benefits. Austria actively supports multilateral space cooperation within the UN since 1957. At the Vienna-based United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, member states currently negotiate and hopefully conclude in 2020 the Space 2030 Agenda. This agenda lists a number of existing international and regional mechanisms, programs, projects and platforms to foster the use of space technologies for sustainable development. One thing is clear, we need to maintain our ambition to protect our environment and fight against climate change in order to boost our resilience and help prevent the emergence and spread of future pandemics. When it comes to coordinated actions to address SDG 13 on climate, it is essential to share the same diagnosis worldwide on the causes, effects and evolution of climate change. In this respect, satellites are key elements as they provide observations that are global, uniform, sustained over years and regularly repeated, offering high resolution as well as broad scale monitoring of our planet. Building on the results of the One Planet Summit in June 2017, UNOSA supports the so-called Space Climate Observatory as an effort of over 20 space agencies to monitor the impact of climate change and thus help decision makers to better define and implement adaptation and mitigation measures with the aim to foster international exchange, cooperation and collaboration among the national space climate observatories, member states can benefit directly from this initiative through the active involvement of UNOSA. <clears throat> In concluding, please allow me to inform you that together with the Office for Outer Space Affairs, Austria developed the World Space Forum 
a new conference series with the aim to open up the UN dialogue with different stakeholders in space. We will start shortly with the preparation of the next World Space Forum in 2021, again in Vienna. Dialogue and information sharing are essential to improve the understanding of the concrete possibilities of use of space technologies. Let me reiterate once more Austria's continued support of international cooperation in the peaceful and sustainable exploration and use of outer space. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for, uh, for your remarks. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here and uh, we look forward to the preparation of uh, the World Space Forum, uh, the 2020 World Space Forum and working together on this. Now, um, our panelists, now that we are, uh, we have finished, we are our panelists. We, I would like to move into um, the Q&A session. Uh, we have um, received quite a, a lot of questions. Um, so, and I see from the chat, um, there, there might be already some questions. Um, I will, I will first of all, perhaps uh, one of the questions that um, um, was asked by the registered participants is how do the space agencies collaborate um, virtually? So um, on this, I would um, like to ask um, uh, JAXA um, to reply to this question, um, see if um, there are any specific comments uh, on on this um, collaboration at virtual level. OK, OK, thank you very much. So, uh, very good questions. And actually, uh, we are not only a uh, collaborating the partial, but also we are doing the, for example, in a real campaign or something. The reason is uh, once we launch the satellite, we cannot fix the instrument. We cannot clean the lens or mirrors. So uh, it is very important to individual instrument showing the same values. If you measure, for example, in the CO2, uh, each instrument has to show the exactly the same values. So to do this, we intercompare with each other and also we are doing some special campaigns. For example, at the time of the year, uh, NASA, JAXA, ESA are jointly join the uh, uh, field in, for example, in the ne uh, Nevada desert, and we measured almost everything in the temperature, surface reflections, and also CO2 uh, density. Such kind of effort is, can demonstrate the effectiveness of the acid observation. So that's why that uh, space agencies inter uh, collaboration is quite important. May I answer the question? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm also I, I'm, I'm more curious to know how this collaboration between space agencies um, came about in the first place. Um, I don't know if any of the other uh, panelists uh, would like to reply to my questions. Perhaps. Um, I think it's. Uh, it I can try to reply to the question. I think we uh, we initiated the first um, dashboard with the European Commission covering uh, Europe, and uh, I mean there was some early discussion between the uh, principal of our agencies and uh, the idea that we could go global and uh, we could uh, really uh, benefit from combining data from uh, the three uh, space agencies. <laughs> Let's see. There was an echo, sorry for that. So this is a bit the, uh, the starting point. And then we had, of course, they set very challenging uh, deadline for, for us. And uh, can Kevin uh, can, can complement my, my answer because we, had, we managed to develop this uh, all teleworking from home and using really uh, modern technology. Uh, I mean, it's modern technology for communicating, uh, modern technology for exchanging uh, data. Uh, recalling that uh, data from uh, the space agency we are using uh, are full, free and open to the public. And we, of course, collaborated in exchanging uh, API on uh, which are shared. The code is shared on, on GitHub. 
So it's a full, uh, a full fledged collaboration we, we have initiated and a, a kind of premiere in the, of, of its kind uh, uh, given the development time. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just add a couple of comments too. Um, I think, you know, as you saw in that last slide of our presentation, a number of people were involved with this project over um, an intense seven to eight week period um, to get the initial version um, done. Uh, and and we really, um, you know, utilized, um, like Eva Louie said, um, the, the capabilities of, of, you know, um, the virtual meeting spaces. Um, uh, but we also enabled each of our groups. Um, so we basically separated our groups into kind of a technical um, development team and then and then scientific indicator teams. Um, and, and we enabled them to operate independently um, to work together to, to work on this. Um, and it really um, was uh, the ability to, to openly share data, to openly share software, um, to openly share APIs and knowledge, um, and, and to allow them to do that independently, um, and then have weekly meetings to kind of coordinate everyone um, that really helped us, I think, deliver um, such an incredible um, amount of information and knowledge um, in, in, in about a two month period. So I see that um, open data, knowledge sharing, and um, the technology allowed you to, to collaborate, to work together. And this has been clearly something very good considering um, the timing and uh, the short amount of period in which, um, uh, in this case, uh, had to reply to um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we also have um, some questions, and this uh, is one of the question, uh, questions in the chat, um, which I would like to also kind of make a little bit broader. Um, and uh, we had a questions on how um, access to space data can be used in um, developing countries and what in this case um, UN uh, spider what steps UN spider is um, taking to um, help uh, manage disasters here the question is um, very specific on Malawi but for the time being I like to have a, a broader overview on the space data uh, for developing countries. Right, good afternoon. Uh, from the point of view of UN Spider, as I mentioned, we basically raise awareness about the type of data that is made available by the space community. And I think that one of the great strengths of the space community is the implementation of open data policies that is facilitating access to satellite imagery free of charge, and this is very beneficial to developing countries. We also see uh, more and more open software that can be used, and so in and Spider, we are developing with partners step-by-step -step procedures to process that type of satellite imagery to generate relevant products. In addition, we raise awareness about the, the uh, data that is commercially available and the products that are commercially available that are higher resolution and how they could be also applied. We do these with the network of regional support offices. We have uh, 24 regional support offices located in countries in Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, Latin America and the US. And we work very well with all of them to try to reach developing countries. I think that one of the key issues that we have to work on when it comes to COVID-19, in addition to remote sensing, is the issue of trying to enhance the use of global navigation satellite systems uh, through smartphones. I think this is a technology that can help us, particularly noticing that unlike natural hazards, which we know where they can be active, we know where earthquakes can take place or where tsunamis can impact coastal areas. And the, there are, let's say, specific regions which are exposed to these hazards. But if we have learned something from COVID-19 is that as it's transferred by people, then maybe the use of these global navigation satellite system tools such as the GPS or Galileo 
or uh, GLONASS or VEDU can help us also address some of the challenges posed by COVID-19 in terms of location-based information. Juan Carlos. Juan Carlos, we lost you. Yes, I, yes. Here we are, perfect. I don't know if you heard my, my reply. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know if you said uh, anything in the past, uh, in the in the last 20 seconds, but uh, we um, heard the rest of it. Yeah, no, sure. it, uh, that's what I wanted to communicate. The usefulness of also thinking, in addition to remote sensing on the use of uh, data from uh, global navigation satellite systems to address COVID-19. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, there is also something that uh, one of the questions that we received that I think is, is really um, interesting and uh, looking uh, forward, let's say, um, so kind of to give uh, also some space to the imagination, what could be um, next in terms of um, upcoming technology in development and how such a technology uh, could support policymakers to work on resilience. So, what could be the next step steps and what could be the next step in terms of technology in this area and i don't know if um maybe um kevin uh, would like to reply if any sure. uh, if any of the speakers has any interesting ideas so so in terms of technology um there are a variety of different types of technology that i think will will be beneficial um, to looking at the environment, to sharing um, information, um, and to helping analyze um, that information. Uh, so, so if we look at, at how the measurements are first conducted, um, uh, there are many agencies, space agencies around the world, and commercial companies um, which are developing new sensing techniques and technologies um, uh, to get a better look at the Earth and its systems um, and tracking those over time. Um, in NASA, we have a thing called the Decadal Survey, um, which really um, uh, identifies and prioritizes um, the missions and the measurements that we will conduct over the next decade. And we have just started um, that process now, um, but there's going to be brand new types of measurements um, that come from uh, uh, that work that we are investing in today. Um, and we'll look better at surface biology um, and geology. We'll look um, better at um, uh, <clears throat> uh, gravity. We'll look better at aerosols. Um, and, and we'll take that information and we're using cloud computing now um, and machine learning to analyze those products and to manage those products and to disseminate those products more quickly. Um, so those are some of the things that, that NASA is doing and I'm sure that the other agencies are, are looking similarly um, uh, far ahead. Thanks. That's very yeah. interesting. And uh, to see these uh, um, ahead of us, um, I don't know if uh, uh, if we you had you wanted to add something. Yeah, I was going to go along the same line. Meets we we got a very important um, uh, decision point in Europe under the uh, in collaboration or. With the uh, European Commission, we got the uh, Copernicus uh, next uh, phase, which is the starting of six uh, new satellites for phase AB1 has been approved and, and the industrial contract have started. So this will bring really additional capability to monitor the environment and, and provide information to, to decision makers and the public. So among other things, we will have a, a carbon dioxide monitoring mission, a mission for polar ice and snow, uh, a microwave uh, radiometer, uh, hyperspectral and uh, L-band synthetic aperture radar, which will com complement very nicely um, the ALOS mission from JAXA. Uh, we are also leveraging uh, on cloud computing technology and artificial intelligence, because some of the results uh, uh, you will see on this dashboard are using AI technology. And we are also the last component, which is uh, essential. We are not considering, we have moved from uh, a classical remote sensing to uh, considering the Earth as a system. So we are really looking at Earth system science, the complex phenomena, 
uh, we improve our understanding of that uh, by being by having all this of course uh, ICT capability and this uh, EO dashboard is a kind of the tip of the iceberg of what can be done with uh, today's technology in a, in a very short period of time so more mission uh, the technology is mature uh, I should not forget the education component because we the dashboard actually is a, a fantastic education tool because you can show a comparison of uh, the situation observed on several environmental parameters uh, prior and uh, during the lockdown, which is a kind of reference period. So it's also a fantastic uh, tool. On education, also on platform, we have um, we are delivering a number of um, massive open online courses which are open to to the the public at large. And uh, we are also seeking to develop some of them for sustainable development goals. So we did some on climate, on radar technology. Uh, we have actually opened a specific portal for for supporting that, which is called eocollege.org in Europe, uh, in collaboration with the German government and the German uh, space agency. That's to complete the answer. Um, thank you very much. I um, believe that's great. Education comes always uh, is one always one of the most important um, thing, and uh, it's it's clearly very important to to share knowledge, share education, and uh, this is something that we need to do um, with developing countries. We need to do uh, with uh, students, professionals, uh, and make sure that everybody has access to the data but also has the ability to process this data and use them for uh, policy making. Um, as part of um, always education, um, as um, UN Spider um, offers different uh, train and UNUS as well offer trainings that of course can be um, used uh, for these specific purposes. Um, now I don't, um, let me see, we are running out of time. Um, so I would say that um, there might be, I believe that these questions might take a little bit too long um, to reply, uh, but uh, I would be happy if um, I will check the remaining questions and I'll be happy to um, if you if you contact the, if you contact me by by email. Um, so I would say like to conclude, I think that um, resilience is is really key. We've seen this um, during this um, uh, webinar uh, when actors are well prepared and informed um, and have uh, strengthened capabilities um, to respond to hazards. Then um, we can save more lives, and this is clearly something that is related to COVID, but also in a broader uh, sense when it's about, we talk about um, climate change and disaster uh, management. So it's something that is really important. So building this uh, uh, resilience and uh, UNUSA in this case is, uh, has taken several steps to improve its ability to support efforts um, of countries um, in building uh, resilience and uh, also making sure to build forward better for the next, uh, for the future. Um, and uh, so UNUSA will continue delivering services to member states um, for um, to, uh, to make sure to work for um, social and economic development and uh, I would if you want to know a little bit more about this I would encourage you to um, uh, visit our website uh, usa.org and, uh, um, and so you can see what exactly we can uh, we can offer you can look at um, you can learn more about how you can benefit and support these activities and uh, with this I would like to um, finish our uh, webinar. Um, I see um, that we are um, on time and uh, we have uh, one minute left. Um, thank you very much to all the participants who joined uh, for your questions. Thank you very much um, to uh, the panelists, to the speakers for joining us and uh, providing such a interesting insights and um, their experiences and remarks. I believe it was um, truly inspiring to hearing from um, all of you 
Uh, and uh, with this, then I would like really to thank you all for participating and uh, UNUSA will organize other um, webinars in the in the future. So please follow our our social media, our website, and you'll be um, informed about this. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice day or evening, depending on where you are. Thanks. <laughs>